dedicated to the strength of the nation. Proudly, we hail. Yes, proudly we hail, starring Barry Fitzgerald in The Luck of Killarney, a United States Army and United States Air Force presentation. Now, here is our producer, the well-known Hollywood showman, C.P. McGregor. Thank you, thank you, and greetings from Hollywood, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to your Theater of Stars, where each week your favorites from the world's film capital join us for your entertainment. That lovable and salty actor, Barry Fitzgerald, is our proudly we hail star and portrays a typical broom in hand Irish janitor in our comedy, The Luck of Killarney. When an efficiency expert tangles with Barry and attempts to retire him for being overage, he learns how this Spanish war veteran defends his job and how things were handled back in 98. The curtain for Act One of The Luck of Killarney in just a moment. Here now is Wendell Niles with an important message. Everywhere in the world, the uniform of the United States Army and the United States Air Force is more than a uniform. It's a badge of courage, a symbol of freedom and democracy. This fact has been true for more than a hundred years, true since the first American soldier set foot beyond our borders as a representative of our country and the principles for which we stand. No other armed service holds the respect of millions everywhere as ours does. Think of this, and you will have every reason to be proud of the men who wear the uniforms of the United States Army and the United States Air Force. Now back at the microphone, our producer. The curtain rises on Act One of The Luck of Killarney, starring Barry Fitzgerald as Tom O'Reilly. <laughs> There was a touch of Killarney Green in King's, a branch of the well-known department store chain that stretched from Maine to California. A touch of Killarney in the person of Tom O'Reilly, veteran of the Spanish-American War, who has been a maintenance man in the store for more years all. As our story begins, we find this venerable old gentleman, broom in hand, sweeping out the office of Brighton Pels, the store's efficiency expert who has long been emulating a comb, getting into everybody's hair. As O'Reilly sweeps, Pell's charming secretary, Edith Winston, enters. Well, good morning, Mr. O'Reilly. Well, hello, to you, Edith. And how are you this fine morning? Oh, pretty good. You? Oh, I couldn't be finer if I was made of gold. <laughs> You're always so chipper. <sighs> well, I suppose you've heard the news. Mr. Adams is gone, transferred to Jacksonville. No. Yes. We're to have a new general manager. You don't, sir. And in the meantime, the genius takes over. Not mahogany head. Yes, Mr. Pells. Well, it could be worse. Eh, you don't have to work all day in the same office with that breathing hulk of efficiency. No, but it's only for a bit, child. As I was telling a few of the boys the other night who went through the Spanish-American War with me, well, we once had a fellow in our outfit called Fleetmouth Cassidy, the Scourge of Chickamauga. Flute mouth? Yeah, that was one of the more considered names we had from. Oh. He could out snore ten men. Well, mm. we thought we'd never get him out of our bags there, Chickamauga. But finally, finally we got him moved over with the other snorers. Did that help? Oh, no end. But flute mouth, well, he was so loud he even woke up the snorers. Oh. So they put him in the bags all by himself. Oh, uh, well, I, I suppose that fixed it, huh? Well, everyone concerned it did. Flute mouth started waking himself up. Developed insomnia, and as far as I know, hasn't snored since. Oh, <laughs> Mr. O'Reilly, some of your stories. Of course, I shouldn't really mention flute mouth in the same breath with mahogany head. But the same thing here, child. We'll move Mr. Pez out of these barracks when the right time comes. You know, Mr. O'Reilly, I like to be around you. Well, no, thank you, child. Where do you get such a sunny disposition? How can you be so happy just... You, you mean just leaning on a broom? <laughs> well, I'll tell you, child. It's just like I have my own little corner of the universe to keep clean. It's me responsibility. I enjoy it. Good morning, Miss Winston. Uh, good morning, Mr. Pell. I'm three minutes late. I'm sorry. I missed two traffic signals. Don't quite know the route yet. 
Ah. Oh. Oh. Well, O'Reilly. Morning, Mr. Fells. Come here, O'Reilly. Yes, sir. What is it, sir? Are you in the habit of cleaning this file? Oh, uh, yes, sir, I am. Then clean it. No, uh, but I, I dusted it thoroughly only this morning. Dusting isn't enough. Get yourself a nail file or some other such tool. A nail file? Wrap around the end of the nail file one thickness of cloth. But what for? <laughs> what for? The centers of these screw heads are a disgrace. Heavens uh, above, I must be insane. Well, you certainly must, O'Reilly. Do it the first time and do it right. Now, remember, that is our byword. No, 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 don't go. There's something else I wish to speak to you about. Let me see what escapes me at the moment. Oh, uh, Miss Winston. Uh, yes, Mr. Powell. Take a memorandum, will you? Yes, sir. Attention all sales personnel. Subject, sharpening of pencils. It has come to the attention of the acting general manager that certain personnel have been negligent in the matter of sharpening pencils, breaking points carelessly and indiscriminately. Please exercise care in this operation in the future. Signed, Brighton Pearls, acting general manager. Will that be all, Mr. Powell? Yes, just tell the department managers by telephone to check the pencil sharpener reservoirs for broken points. I want to be sure this memorandum affects an improvement. Uh, very good, Mr. Powell. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. All right, yes. Now I know what I don't want to talk to you about. Yes, sir. And it isn't very pleasant. Yeah, I thought it was probably something nauseating. Sir. Yeah, you're psychic, O'Reilly. Mm-hmm. You see, I've had the brooms of all janitors checked for wear during the last month. And yours, O'Reilly, is a quarter of an inch longer than the rest. A quarter of an inch less wear than the rest. Heavens above. No. You see, O'Reilly, I have my ways of finding out who leans on the broom all day. Oh, Mr. Pels, I'm surprised you should make such an allegation. That you can stand here accusing me of laziness when you should be complimenting me. Oh, is that so? Well, then how do you account for the fact that your broom shows... Being a master of my trade, sir, I take fewer strokes per square foot of pace, space covered. Oh, is that so? Well, oh, my, well, I hadn't thought of that. Mm. Yet I'd be glad to teach my technique to the others. Oh, well, yes, then it's a good idea, really. Yes, well, we'll have to try that. Yes, well, I... You know, I think I'll go down to the beverage bar and count noses. So much time is wasted there. I'll be back shortly, Miss Winston. Oh, good for you, Mr. O'Reilly. He thought he had me for a minute, didn't he? Oh, he sure did. Uh, say, I'd better empty the pencil sharpener before Mr. Nosy gets back. You too? Yes, I think I broke a point a couple of weeks ago. Morning, Mr. O'Reilly. Hello, Waldo. Good morning, darling. Waldo. I mean, good morning, Miss Winston. <laughs> yeah, say, what is this? What's wrong with the two of you? <laughs> Nothing. Uh, may I have the meal, Waldo? Oh, sure, here. Uh, just a minute, Waldo. Isn't that a wedding band on your left hand? Oh, oh so it is. <laughs> oh, Waldo, I told you not to wear it. Oh, but it's so pretty. Then it's that the, the, the two of you, you, you're married. Yes, Mr. O'Reilly. You're the only one in the store to know it. Waldo and I, we've been married a year. What? What? He said, yeah, congratulations. <laughs> she gave it to me on our anniversary We. Couldn't afford it when we were first married. And we couldn't afford it now. Give it to me, Waldo. Oh, Edith. Uh, thank you. I told you never to wear it at the store. You know Mr. Pell's rule about married couples? He says they're inefficient. He would. Why, only last week he fired a couple who got married. Oh, Waldo, have you been wearing this ring all morning? Oh, yes. Oh, somebody I... surely saw it. And at a time like this, when we both need our jobs more than at any time before. Now, what is it, my dear? What is it? You tell Mr. O'Reilly, Waldo. I'm uh, about to become a father. <laughs> ah, that's downright beautiful. Mr. O'Reilly, you don't think anybody saw the ring on Waldo, do you? Well, oh. Waldo. Oh. Yes, Mr. Pelson. I find you here. Yes, you find me here. What's wrong with you, Waldo? Are you married, married? to this room? Oh. They're looking for their mail in accounting. Oh, how nice of accounting. I'll get it right down to them. Come back, Waldo. What's that? You've dropped a paperclip. Well, Mr. O'Reilly, how, how do you like the new company restaurant Mr. Pell started? Well, the food's all right, Dad, but they don't give you enough of it. Uh, portions are pretty small. Uh, sure. You know what he has in the kitchen there? No, what? He has a pea counter. Counts out exactly 30 peas per plate. No more, no less. <laughs> Excuse me. What is it, waiter? You've used two paper napkins. Please make one do next time. Yes, yes. Paper is still one of our scarcest commodities, you know. Come on, Waldo, I can't stand it another minute. That pairs making a sweet little girl prattle that sort of thing to you when you're trying to fill your stomach. Oh, I sure hope nobody saw that ring and told him about it. 
I was crazy to wear it, I guess, at a time like this. So you're going to be a father, huh? I am, and believe me, I'm plenty nervous. Ah, oh, there's no reason, lad, why fathers have been having children clear down through the age. Well, not my child, they haven't. Well, regardless of me, boy, you have many great things to look forward to. Oh, and one in particular. Oh, what's that, Mr. O'Reilly? The day you bring your boy home his first electric train. Electric train. <laughs> wow, I had a swell one. Signals, automatic switches, boy, uh... Oh, what if we have a girl? Well, you still have an excuse. You buy the train for the boy that's coming next time. Oh, gee, thanks. I, I like the way you figure, Mr. O'Reilly. I just hope everything works out all right and nobody reports that ring to Mr. Pels. Edith gets very tough with me sometimes. Oh, does she throw things at you? Yes, and just her wind-up is something fierce. Well, don't worry, lad. I feel it in me bones. Everything is going to be fine. <laughs> Good morning, Edith. You. Me? Yes, you. What's happened, Judge? Oh, everything. Mr. Pells knows all about Waldo and me being married. He's gone down now to get Waldo. Yeah, but I didn't tell anyone. Did somebody spot the ring that day? Oh, no, no, no. Oh, yeah, but then how... Uh, uh, how? You had to talk to Waldo about electric trains, that's how. Yeah, but this makes no sense, Judge. Oh, yes, it does. You light the fire, so Waldo has to go down and buy one. They don't sell trains here, but Waldo finds out where they do. He has to go out and buy an electric train for the baby I'm not even going to have for five months. Yeah, but how did Mr. Pels find out? Waldo couldn't pay cash for the train. Had to buy it on time. So the droop fills out a questionnaire. Uh -uh. His name, name of his wife, where he works. He fills it all out, never dreaming they'd call over here to check up. That's Waldo. Well, they do call. I'm not in the office. Mr. Pell talks to them. Oh, say no more, me dear. This is calamitous. Mr. Pell's just now stormed out to get Waldo, shouting infamy, perfidy, and two other words I, I didn't even understand. Well, Mr. O'Reilly, what are you going to do about it? What am I going to do? Yes, you got us into this, you did. Yeah, I suppose I did. Well, I'll get you out, me dear. Now, ah. don't you worry, didn't I save the boys from the scourge of Chickamauga? Flute Mouth Cassidy. Well, you said you did anyway. Oh, but I only had me colonel to talk to now. <laughs> Depart from our story, The Luck of Killarney, starring Barry Fitzgerald, to bring you an important message from our government. Let's face it, men. Day after tomorrow, as history develops, a man with wings will be the man with a future. Many young men of today who are aware of this have taken a step that will give them wings. These young men have signed up for the United States Air Force Aviation Cadet Training. At the close of the course, when they have completed the training successfully, they will receive their pilot's wings and a commission as second lieutenant in the U.S. Air Force Reserve. And they will be ordered on active duty at once. Outstanding graduates will receive regular commissions in the Air Force immediately, while others will have the opportunity to qualify for a regular commission while they're on active duty. Here, then, is a future for most young men with our eyes on the sky. The requirements are that you be between the ages of 20 and 26 and one half, that you are single with two years of college or the equivalent, that you are physically fit, as an aviation cadet, you'll be on your way to a great career. As an aviation cadet, you'll be opening the door to a bright future. Find out now if you qualify. Get your application today at your nearest Air Force base or U.S. Army and U.S. Air Force recruiting station. <laughs> The curtain rises on Act Two of The Luck of Killarney, starring Barry Fitzgerald as Tom O'Reilly. There is considerable suspense in the office of Brighton Pels, efficiency expert and acting general manager of King's Department Store, one of the branches of the national chain. For Mr. Pels, who was unanimously voted heel of the month by King's employees, has discovered that his secretary, Edith Winston, has been secretly married to Waldo, the mail clerk. A marriage which violates Mr. Pell's strict edict, no man and wife employees in the store. In Pell's office, Edith and the venerable Tom O'Reilly look up as Mr. Pell's enters, dragging Waldo by the ear. 
Well, Waldo? Well, let me go. Is that woman standing there, my secretary? Is she your wife? She's my wife. Oh, Waldo, you had to go and buy an electric train. Dad, uh, <laughs> son, you jumped the gun on me. Well, how was I to know? Now I should discharge both of you. But Mrs. Waldo has been loyal and efficient. And sometimes how can a fragile woman withstand brute men? Now listen. Easy, easy, Waldo. Mrs. Waldo, you may remain as my secretary. Waldo, come with me. I'll get you your wages. I ought to sock him. That's what I ought to do. Why, Waldo, what's come over you? Easy, lad. Hold your temper. There was no time to fly off the handle. Mr. O'Reilly's right. Coming, Waldo? I'm coming. Well, at least one of you is still working. Yes, and it's a good thing, too. But when Mr. Pells finds out I'm going to have a baby... There, there, me dear. Now, don't you fret. Everything will work out, I'm sure. Oh, you always say that. Well, that's my philosophy. That's what kept me spirits up when Flute Mouth Cassidy was blasting us out of the bags with a snoring and we were, we were trying to quiet him. Well, it's the best way to look at things, all right. Sure. Oh, but it would give me great pleasure, like Waldo, to punch him on the nose just once. But sometimes it's better to retreat with valor than to advance when you know you can't win. I'll check with you tomorrow, Edith. <laughs> Well, morning. What's cooking? Oh, well, quite a bit, Mr. O'Reilly. Mr. Pells hasn't filled Waldo's job yet. Oh, that's good news. Isn't it? And something else. Mr. Pells may go to the Toledo store. No, really? Yes. <laughs> well, hurrah for our side. Soon, I hope. Well, right away, according to the teletype. The front office wants it. They're just waiting for confirmation from Toledo. Now, isn't that great? You see what I tell you? Everything works out. It always does. Check with you tomorrow. <laughs> Has he left yet? No, and he isn't going. He isn't? Toledo won't have him. Oh, I don't blame them a bit. Well, then... And what's more, he's interviewing men for Waldo's job. Oh, dear me, isn't that a speck of good news? Well, our new manager's coming. His name is Mr. Olson. Olson, really? Well, maybe he's a square shooter. If so, he'll sure see it our way. Well, that's something to hope for. Well, see you in the morning. Has he come yet? Yeah, who? Oh, oh, you mean Mr. Olson, the new manager. That's right. He arrives tomorrow. Well, we've got a fighting chance, then. I'm afraid not. Mr. Pells is delighted. He says he and Mr. Olson have worked together before. Oh, me. And they'll surely have Waldo's job filled in a day or so. Has Waldo tried elsewhere to line up something? Yes, but you know how things have tightened up. And you know Waldo. Yes, I know Waldo. Well, it's all but a, only a challenge to us. But it's almost more than I can bear. He's after you now, Mr. O'Reilly. Me? He says he's going to weed out all the old-timers. Old-timer? He can never put me in that category. But he said he didn't like the way you spoke the day he fired Waldo. He had me look up your folder to get your age. The age? Uh-huh. Mr. Pelz is inaugurating a new plan, retiring everyone at 65. Well, let me tell you, he was furious when there wasn't even an application blank on you. When I was hired, there wasn't even a store, hardly. Well, anyway, he's heard you talk about the Spanish-American War. He says if you served in the Spanish-American War, you'd almost have to be over 65. Uh-uh. Maybe you better tip off your buddies uh, to keep Mum, huh? Yeah, I'll do that by all means. You'd better be prepared for Mr. Pelz. He's really gunning for you. <laughs> You sent for me, Mr. Pelz. Yes, O'Reilly. Back in the dark ages, when you were first hired by this company, they didn't keep complete records. I wonder if you'd give me the date of your birth? Yeah, me, uh, uh, me birth. That's right. Well, no, I don't rightly recall. Oh, come now, O'Reilly. Yeah, but I don't. But I surely do. you must remember? Yeah, but I don't. And you're being unfair to ask it. Oh, I am. Now, you're asking a man to remember something that happened back before the Dark Ages. Hey, now, now, really, I'll stand for no flippancy. However, if you want to know how old I am, really, Mr. Pell. Yes, well, that's better. Well, a man is as old as he feels, and I feel about 27. Now, listen, O'Reilly, tell me this. Are you or are you not a veteran of the Spanish-American War? That question sounds entirely irrelevant. Oh, it does. Well, then, listen. I call for the roster of veterans of the Spanish-American War, and they won't send it. Yeah, the privilege, I'm sure. Yeah. Did you have anything to do with it? I, I don't understand you. Now, you listen to me, O'Reilly. 
With my own ears, I've heard you talk about the barracks at Chickamauga, of embarking at Tampa for Cuba. Mr. Pelzer, amongst my many past accomplishments, I was once a writer of fiction. The habit sometimes takes over me speech. Oh, O'Reilly, you bother me. Oh, excuse me, sir, but there's a man here who insists on seeing Mr. O'Reilly. Well, upon me word, I up and found you, I did. Tommy O'Reilly, you son of a gun. Sure, I'm glad to see you. Oh, well, as I live and breathe, it's fluke milk Cassidy. And did I have trouble finding you? Why, the boys here wouldn't tell me a thing. Yeah, the boys? Well, you got them all buffaloed, like you used to have them at Chickamauga. Did you say Chickamauga? Uh, flu, 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 please, please. If I please what? Don't these people know you won the war in 98, single-handed? You always used to say who did. <laughs> oh, dear. Flute mouth, if the boys here in town wouldn't tell you where I am, how did you find me? Why, uh, the national roster's got you listed, Tom. I always carry one when I hit to do a place. Helps out looking up the boys. Flute mouth, you was a pain in me neck 50 years ago, and you haven't changed a bit since. Take him out, Egypt. I want to speak to Mr. Pelz alone. Uh, uh, on, well, well Tom, I didn't mean to be buttoning in anything, of course. Well, O'Reilly, then you did serve a hitch in the army. Yeah, Mr. Pelz, and I've often wished I served a dozen more. Mr. Pelz, you can't blame me for me defending my job. I cannot countenance prevarication in any form. Oh, I didn't prevaricate, Mr. Pelz. I merely evaded the question. One is as bad as the other. You can be assured I'll rush your retirement papers through. I know, please, Mr. Pelz. In pointy years, I'm an old man, I know, but I'm sufficient for my job. Statistics prove, O'Reilly, 65 is the optimum retirement age. <laughs> and you are well over that. Yeah, yes, I am. But, Mr. Pelz, listen to me. Never before in my life have I begged a man for anything, but I'm begging you to give me my job. It's really what keeps an old man going. And I'm sorry. I'm sorry, O'Reilly. It's always difficult to turn a fire horse out to pasture, but uh, we'll make it as painless as possible. I think I can have you ready to leave by tomorrow night. Very well. I have no more arguments in me. Well? Tomorrow's my last day, Edith. Oh, Mr. O'Reilly, I'm so sorry. Where's Flutemouth? He's waiting down the hall. Oh, I can't wait to leave me get me hands on him. Well, he'll see you in the morning. Well, good morning, me dear. Why, Mr. O'Reilly, you sound so happy. Well, and why can't a man be happy? Well, yes, but, well, after all, this is your last day. Ah, no, I think I'll stick around a bit. Stick around. As a matter of fact, I just called Waldo and told him to report back to his old job. Waldo? Mr. O'Reilly, did you and Flutemouth have a fight last night? Were you hit in the head? Flutemouth? No, not with that wonderful lad. Oh, wonderful lad. Yeah, had, oh, I had dinner with him last night. Ah, he's a lovely boy. Yes, he moved to town with his daughter, as sweet a girl as Cassidy ever produced. I, I don't understand. Well, she married a Swede, and he fixed us up a lovely dish. Oh, you smorgasbord. boy. Good morning, Mrs. Waldo. I'm two minutes late. I'm sorry. I had to stop at a drugstore for an aspirin. Headache. And that isn't the only headache you're going to have, Well, What's that, O'Reilly? Out of me way, you fool. I got to sweep this floor. Yeah, why, ma'am, are you insane? Mr. O'Reilly. Oh, he said out of me way, pals, before I smack you with the business end of this floor. Yeah, uh, this man's crazy. I'll, I'll have the store police eject him. I'll report this to our new general manager, Mr. Olsen. Wait a minute, Mr. O'Reilly. Flutemouth's daughter, you say, is married to a Swede? Our new general manager, Mr. Olsen. Oh, Mr. O'Reilly, that's wonderful. Yes, I met the lad last night. Had a long talk with him about certain affairs of the store. Uh -huh. Pearls in particular. Needless to say, we were in perfect agreement. Hello, darling. Somebody called and told me to report to work. Oh, darling, it's true. You're starting back to work. Oh, Mr. O'Reilly, what do you think Mr. Olsen will do to Mr. Pearls? Well, I made him promise not to commit mayhem. But I don't understand. Mr. Pell said they'd worked together before. Yeah, correct. That's why Mr. Olson swears they never worked together again. Oh, it's a lovely day indeed, if you look at the sunshine, isn't it? Indeed. curtain falls in the final act of The Luck of the Killarney. Our star, Barry Fitzgerald, will return for a curtain call after this timely message from Wendell Niles. There are thousands of men in the United States to whom the term AAA has a special meaning. They are the veterans of the anti-aircraft artillery of the armed services. This communication is specially for them. You see, you AAA veterans, of all the armed services, your skills are needed now 
by the anti-aircraft artillery outfits of the U.S. Army. Enlistment now means you will help bring the AAA up to its proper strength. And to you personally, it means a secure and exciting future. Experienced AAA veterans will be enlisted in grades according to skill and length of service. In many cases, you'll be able to get back your old grade and to rejoin your old outfit. And more, the peacetime United States Army offers you benefits possible only in an Army career. Interesting, exciting work at good pay. Food, clothing, quarters, and medical care. So think this over, you veterans of the AAA. Your old anti-aircraft artillery outfit has a vacancy for you now. Your special skills can help keep our country at peace. An Army career is open for you. Visit your local United States Army recruiting station today. Now, once again, our star, Barry Fitzgerald, and our producer. Motion picture audiences have come to regard Barry Fitzgerald as one of the deans of Hollywood character actors. A lovable man, pipe in mouth, heart of gold beneath a salty disposition. Well, I tell you, C.B., it's my golf game that does it. Oh, I had the disposition of a saint before I took it up. I know exactly what you mean. Well, Barry, it's a real pleasure to have you back on another Proudly We Hail. You know, a character from the old sod, lovable, high integrity. Yeah, yes, if that has anything to do with knocking off a couple of strokes here and there off my scorecard, well, yeah, I'm there. Sure, what's a few strokes between friends? Oh, nothing, just cause for mayhem, if you knock off as many as I do. You should go a couple of rounds with Crosby and Hope. Yeah, I should, but I won't anymore. You won't? Why? Well, they won't let me. Uh, what you said a while ago, uh, integrity. Integrity? Hope and Crosby? Oh, no, me. And I won't play unless I can keep score. I think I'm beginning to understand. Oh, I could show those two whippersnappers a thing or two. I don't doubt it. Yeah, they say my threes look like eights on their cards. But plain enough on mine. Why, they never made a three in their lives. Well, that's what I came on telling them. But you made yours fairly. Oh, as honest as Paddy speak. Then I imagine they didn't get a little upset. A little upset? No, C.P. You know, you know that I'm the mildest tempered man in the world. Sure. Look, those two act like a couple of dervishes if you nip off a stroke or two here and there. They take their golf seriously. Oh, it's life and death with the man. You'd think they couldn't afford to pay me a few dollars a hole. Well, Barry, you come out to my club with me tomorrow. There won't be any argument. Yes, yeah, sure, I know that. You're a sensible man. But uh, I keep score, man. <laughs> Listen, tell me, C.B., who's playing here in your theater next time? Next week, Barry, and ladies and gentlemen, the highly talented actor Barry Sullivan will be our star in a comedy titled The Martins and the McCoys. It is a bright story of the New York theater and the elements that comprise that world of entertainment, their feuds and their jealousies. Sure, and I'll be listening. Goodbye, C.P. Goodbye, Barry Fitzgerald. <laughs> be sure to join us next week, ladies and gentlemen, when we bring you Barry Sullivan in the Martins and the McCoys. Until then, this is C.P. McGregor saying thanks for listening, and cheerio from Hollywood. <laughs> Barry Fitzgerald appears with the courtesy of the Hollywood Coordinating Committee, which arranges for the appearance of all stars on this program. The script was by Rich Hall, with music under the direction of Eddie Scrivener. The program is transcribed in Hollywood for release at this time. Wendell Niles speaking.